Mike, I'm the lead pastor here at City Life, and if this is your first time, we are really glad you're here. We hope that you continue to come back and make this a part of your rhythm and your schedule. Uh, One of the things that we want to do is we want to kind of drill down in your brain about like future church and what that's going to look like, because church has changed forever, uh, as has most of the world in the things that we used to participate in and things that we used to do because of the last six months that we spent inside of our homes in quarantine. And so what we're doing is we're telling you this, we're being very honest with you, because we think God is rewriting a different future for the church. And so we, we're looking at things like what, what are called kingdom innovation, where we're asking a lot of questions around the church on why we do the things that we do. Why have these things been like this throughout history that have just continued? And I think God did us, honestly, a really big favor. Because the church was losing ground anyways. If you look at the statistics and you look at the people who are coming to faith, the church is being planted and started versus the population growth and the church is closing. That gap was rapidly spreading apart, not in a good way. So they weren't coming together in the model of church that is being done. And I think God reset the whole system and said, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention to what I'm doing in the world and then meet that as a church. And so this is what we're doing. So for example, we started this series called Made for More because we think every follower of Jesus is made for more than what they're doing. And what I mean by that is that doesn't mean you do more. You answer some very intentional questions like, who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? And where am I to go to do that? Okay. Fundamental questions that we're going to look at, but most of us don't have the answer to those questions in our life. And so this is what we want to unlock for you. And so this shift and this changeover is, and the prevailing model of church is, we can do it as the professionals and the elders and the leaders, and you guys can help us. We are shifting this to honestly the biblical model of you can do it and we can help you accomplish it. So for an example, we want you to be able to come to church because this is where you get to worship corporately. This is where you get to pray and take communion, see your friends, be in community, get challenged with the word. But then you have 167 other hours of the week that we want to equip you to live your life completely and fully in that, okay? Because right now, I think a lot of the frustration is met with, I come to church, I get what I need for Sunday, but then the rest of the week, man, I just don't feel like I have what I need. So I'm going to join a small group, and that's great. You should. And that's going to give me my community piece. That's going to let me have some accountability with friends and believers. But, but you guys, it's just not getting it done. We are seeing more and more lostness in our cities. That number is growing and growing and growing. And the only way to change that is what we're going to look at today. We're actually going to have a, a visual. Is if every single follower of Jesus lives into the masterpiece that they are created to be. So let me ask you, have you ever considered yourself a masterpiece? Like you've probably considered yourself a failure, at times in your life, probably a success at other times in your life, probably a great person, probably a horrible person, depending on the things that you've done in your life, the the levels of success you've achieved, the lows that you've hit, you've probably considered yourself a lot of things, but have you ever considered yourself a masterpiece? The reason why I'm asking this question is because if you're a follower of Jesus, he created you to be a masterpiece. He calls you a masterpiece. Now, For those of you in this room that are not yet following Jesus, this is what I want you to hear today. There is something more for your life. We, yes, we say it's Jesus. You may disagree with us on that, and that is okay. But what we want you to hear is there's something more to life than what I'm doing. We want to have a conversation about that with you today. So before we jump into all this, we've got to pray, and we've got to ask God to do something in this service. But before we jump into that, we're going to integrate something new into our service each week as well. We have the privilege of working with an organization called Christ Together. And they, see, they find a point person in a city, and they ask them to work to unify the churches in that city. And I want to pull these names of these churches up here because I started to connect with some of the pastors around our city, and I started to ask them what it would be like to work together to unify the body of Christ in this city. And so I've been able to get them around the table. The organization Christ Together came in, and they kind of pitched this vision. And then I um, facilitated our very first meeting with these pastors. And so I want you to, to pay attention to what's on the screen. So New Heights is Pastor Ken Johnson. Some of you may know him. He was a Colts chaplain for 30 years. We helped him plant a uh, multi-ethnic church up on the northwest side. 
Matt Giebler, he's a pastor at Greenwood Christian Church. Um, the church has been around for a long time, a staple in the community of Greenwood. Antioch, Andrew Zanaco. Um, it's a fairly new church doing some incredible things on the north side. Redeemer Bible, which has just been renamed from Harvest Indy South. Pastor Brock Graham. Um, Emmanuel, Danny Anderson, that church has been around for about 40 years. Danny has led there for about 20. Uh, and then, of course, City Life, we're a part of this. And so we're going to pray for these churches by name every Sunday and their pastors because we want to put forward the 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 view and the um, picture of what unity can look like. Now, these are just the ones involved right now. We literally just had our first meeting. So as more churches come on board with this, we'll be putting their names up here and praying for them as well. But the reason why we're doing this is we want you to see, like, as you drive through your neighborhood and maybe you see a, a Greenwood Christian sign, a Redeemer Bible, or a manual sign, we don't want you to drive by and go, you losers don't go to my church, but I mean, it's cool you go to church. Is that just me? Anybody else didn't do that? Okay, sorry. But anyways, <laughs> we want you to go like, hey, we're, we're on this mission together. And as I drive by, I want to go over and I want to talk to that person. Like, hey, you go to Emmanuel. Hey, our church prayed for you this morning. Uh, our church prayed for you last week. I know we're working on this thing together. Because if you would ask a non-Christian person, hey, do you think the churches are unified and work together? It's pretty much going to be a resounding no. And we want to shift that culture here in our city and see what God does with that. So... I'm going to pray for our service, and we're going to pray for these churches by name. Would you guys join me? God, we love you, and we thank you so much for what you're doing here at City Life. I'm so grateful I get to be a part of this, God. I pray that you would continue to lead us uh, in the direction and the vision of what you want to see happen with your church. God, there has been so many changes introduced to us in our lives this year. Um, I think we're all ready to just start 2021 right now in September, if you're okay with that. Um, because this has just been an incredibly difficult year. But at the same time, I I'm, I'm, haven't been this excited about church in, I don't think, ever in my life, God. Because I think what you're doing right now is, is you're rewriting something that we get to be a part of. You're showing us how you want us to be able to innovate, to take on the future of, of this world in the all of the messiness and problems that come along with that, God, we know and still believe that you are truly the answer. So God, I pray today that we would realize that you've created us to be masterpieces that live and work in specific contexts with very specific giftings that you've given us. God, we want to pray for the other churches who also want to see unity happen for New Heights and Pastor Ken, for Greenwood Christian Church and Pastor Matt, for Redeemer Bible Church and Pastor Brock, for uh, Emmanuel and Pastor Danny and for Antioch and Pastor Andrew. God, that we would be able to come together as churches and show this city something that they have never seen before because it's not being done right now. So God, we pray for great favor on this undertaking. We also pray for protection away from the enemy who's going to try to destroy this immediately because unity is what Jesus prayed for for his believers. And the enemy knows that if they can unify around the around Jesus, that some incredible things are going to happen, and so he's going to do everything he can to disrupt this. So God, we pray for today that our hearts be open to the message you have. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope you guys are excited about this. We are. We're really excited to see what God is going to do with this. So um, I, I, let me ask you a question. Like, what makes a masterpiece? So if you've ever seen the Mona Lisa, or you've ever seen some of the famous sculptures, or maybe the Sistine Chapel, there was a blank canvas, a piece of clay, and this originator actually created what is now considered a masterpiece. And one of the definitions that I was looking for this morning, it said that uh, clearly the work of art is the masterpiece, but then the question is, is can the creator be considered a masterpiece too? And the answer is a resounding yes, because the creator is the one who thought of this process, who shaped that piece of clay, who painted this now masterpiece. And so it originated from the master or the person itself. And as the definition says that the masterpiece is always tied to the master. And what I want you to understand about that is you as a follower of Jesus, you, his masterpiece, are always tied to the master. In the this is an incredible grace and a gift to us that we want to start to unpack. So there's three fundamental questions. If you have your Bibles, go to Ephesians 2. We're going to walk through and we're going to answer some of these because I think more often times than not, we see ourselves as the mistakes in our lives, not the masterpieces that God intended us to be. I mean, I mean think about all of the things that you've done that just play in your mind over and over and over again. 
If it's your successes, that's what you cling to for the good. Most of the time, though, it's all of our failures because our life is typically and traditionally marked by our failures. But that's not living into the masterpiece mission that God has put you on. I mean, of course, our failures are going to mark us, and we need to be able to learn from them and move forward from them. But what I want you to understand is there's three questions that we want you to answer today. Who am I created to be? Like, do you actually know who you are created to be? Because this is a design question. Now, if you would say, I don't know, I, what I want you to know is on the other side of your creator has not said he doesn't know how he created you. He very specifically created you to live at this place in time, to go through 2020, to live in the place that you live t- because he wants to use your giftings to show this world that there's something different to live for. So the question I would have you answer is, who are you made to be? For most of you, that's just where you need to start. You have no idea, honestly. But the second one is, what am I made to do? Now, this one seems to be a little bit easier for us, whether by default or we just like what we're doing. The default is, hey, I can pay my bills with this job. This is what I'm going to do for a living. And that, a lot of times it's how we arrive at that conclusion, what I'm made to do. I assure you, assure you, God did not create you, gift you, put you in a certain specific place in time to work your life away at a job just to become successful here on earth unless that is what he called you to do and then you will be on mission every step of the way using it for the kingdom, not your kingdom. So really, really big difference. I mean, honestly, do you think that God would create you to just work your life away and work all these hours and have this nice big account and and have a retirement fund where you can go hang out on the beach? Do you honestly think that's what God created you for? I mean, I know that sounds nice. To me, it sounds super boring and horrible because sand gets everywhere. But anyways, (laughs) like that is not what God created you to do. I remember John Piper asked this question in his book, Don't Waste Your Life. He said, I want you to answer the question for me, which one of these two stories is more tragic? There was a mother and daughter who felt called to go into the jungle. I don't remember where it was, uh, and it was a mountainous region. They were going to a prayer meeting where they were serving this, um, basically like this orphanage and mission. Their brakes failed on the way there. They plummeted off the side of the mountain to their death. On the other side of the story... There was a couple who did everything right investment-wise, career-wise, and they had an incredible retirement. And their life now consisted of waking up whenever they wanted, walking on the beach looking for seashells, and they literally had everything that they wanted. And he said, which story is more tragic? Now, in our flesh, we would go, oh my gosh, the mom and daughter died? That's horrible. He says, that's not the tragic story. They were doing what God called them to do, and they died doing what they loved because they knew exactly what God called them to do, and they did not waste their life. But on the other side of the American dream, this retirement with large funds and bank accounts, that is the tragic story because that is not what God has called us to do unless you're using all of that for his kingdom, not yours. Really big difference. Then this third question is, what am I to go, where am I to go to do this? So this is a position question. Who am I created to be? What am I made to do? And where am I to go to do it? Let's look at Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I want you to picture a zombie. If you're young in here, don't look at the screen. Everybody else, look at the screen. Okay, this is what I want you to picture, all right? This is you without Jesus. Beautiful picture, right? Some of you ladies spend a long time to get your makeup to look like that. (laughs) I'm kidding. Back off. Okay. All right, we can get rid of that. So but what I want you to understand is he says, basically, this is you walking around as a corpse. You're clearly breathing. You're clearly living, but you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay. Verse 2. In which you had previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit, now working in the disobedience. Now look very close at verse 3. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. So he's putting all of us on the same level, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh in thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others also were. Now we need to do work here. 
I've grown up in church my entire life. My parents brought me to church. They told me when I was six days old. I spent four years out of church because what I grew up in seemed just like a bunch of rules and regulations to me, and I wanted no part of that when I became an adult. But I thought I was a follower of Jesus that entire time because I went to church three times a week. I brought my friends to church. I knew Bible verses. I knew the Sunday school drills, and I knew everything that there was to know about church. But this was the description of my life. What I want you to see about this, there is a very clear distinction here, and this is why most Christians are frustrated with life. We too all previously, here's our timeline distinction, lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. Without Jesus, you have nothing else to do except this. My flesh says to do it, I just do it. I feel like it, I'm going to do it. I think it, I'm going to do it. Like what happens is, is we're, we're slaves to our flesh. We are just doing whatever it is we feel like. But the difference is when you surrender your life to Jesus, he says, okay, that was the way you live. This is the way you live now. So he's making a very clear distinction. Here was my frustration. I went to church constantly. I memorized scripture all the time. I brought lots of people to this church and I was miserable because I thought, because I prayed a prayer, I had a relationship with Jesus. But that's not what the Bible says salvation is. The Bible says salvation is a surrendering of my life to him because I believe he truly is the savior of this world. I believe he is the one who died on the cross. I believe he is the one who was put in a grave. I believe he is the one who came back to life, resurrected back to life, to put sin and death and shame to death once and for all. And when I surrender my life to that and I ask him to be Lord over my life, my life changes because the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of me. I can no longer live like this. You want to know why some of you are frustrated? You fit in one of two camps. Either you never truly surrendered your life to Jesus and therefore salvation is not actually present in your life or you have surrendered your life to him and you are so far off base, you're over here just living and doing whatever you want. But let me just make one thing clear about being over here. There is something called the Holy Spirit and conviction that is happening in your life continually over here. Because we saw a few weeks ago, God is a jealous God, meaning he wants your allegiance to him. So if I'm over here and I've truly surrendered my life to Jesus, I'm going to know something is off. And I'm going to be drawn back here to the center to get my life reconnected to Jesus. So I don't want you to go, well, that's probably me. I've surrendered, but I'm over here now. And, you know, that's just how it is. I need to get back over here. Listen, I, I don't want to skip over this and, and take this lightly. Because the Bible is so clear that every single person is going to look Jesus in the face one day and he's going to ask them, what did you do with me? Did you realize that I was the Savior? Yes, I surrendered to your life, Jesus. Okay, well, let's see. And it's, there's no f- special formula. You surrendered to him and lived your life for him or you didn't, church. It's very, very clear in scripture. And the reason why a lot of us are really frustrated is this right here. We still live to our flesh. We still do whatever it says, which means we either aren't truly followers or we're completely disconnected from intimacy with Jesus doing whatever we want. You have to figure out if that's you today, which one of these you're in, if this is you. But what I want you to understand about this is he makes a sharp turn now to some encouragement, all right? But look at verse four. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. Here's what I want you to comprehend about that. Jesus knows every sin you've ever done, ever thought that nobody else on this planet will ever know. And he rescued you anyways, if you're his follower. And the fact that this room is silent blows my mind. Did you hear what I just said, y'all? He knows everything you've ever done or thought or said or wanted to say, and he rescued you anyways. (laughs) If you honestly grasp that, we can never live like verse 3 says. 
How could I give in to my fleshly desires if I truly understand that? Will I give in to them? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to sin all the time. But the Holy Spirit that's inside of me is going to go, no, no, no. That's not what we do anymore. Surrender that back to me, and I'm going to move back over here in intimacy with Jesus. And then I'm going to stray again, and I'm going to mess up. And then the Holy Spirit's going to go, nope, that's not what we do either. We're going to come back over here, and I'm going to realign myself with Jesus. This will be something that happens until the day that I see Jesus face to face. That's not what we're saying. What I'm saying is, I'm being directed by God. If something just catches my attention, I stray into it a little bit. And then I feel the Holy Spirit say, this is not what we do as a follower now, and I come back over here. This is what a life of repentance looks like. I walk away, I confess, I turn around, and I come back. Okay? What I want you guys to understand is a lot of our frustration is met because this process never happens. And the further you stay over here, unconfessed and unrepent, the further you just drift and you drift and you drift. And then honestly, a lot of the stuff that you're doing, it doesn't even bother you anymore. It's become second nature because you're just giving in to your flesh again. Something inside of you is like, this is not right, and you know it. You need to get your life right. Listen to what I'm telling you through these scriptures. You need to turn back, confess this, go back to me, and we say things like, I know, I know I need to, I know I need to, I know I need to. But church, you need to decide where you're at because you can never answer the question of who you're created to be, what you're made to do, or where you're to go to do it until you get this part figured out, okay? Two camps. You're either truly a follower of Jesus and you need to confess and repent if this is you out there or you've never actually surrendered your life to him and you have just prayed a prayer like I did. But what I can tell you is the day that I surrendered my life to Jesus, it has never been the same since 21 years ago. I immediately, my eyes were awakened to the truth of who he was. The Holy Spirit lived inside of me and it has never been the same since. The thing I want you to understand about this is When we start to answer these questions, verse 4 and 5 that we just read, who am I created to be? This answers this for you. You are made alive, you're forgiven, you're seated with Christ, and you're receiving immeasurable riches. That is who you're made to be. We get so hung up on profession and all of these things. Should I marry someone? Should I stay single? No, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. This is who you're made to be. The do and the go part, we can figure that stuff out later. But let's look at verse 6. So he goes in to verse 6, and here's what he says. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 8 and 9 is the crux of the gospel. You ready? You are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So let's talk about these two verses for a second. This is what I need you to understand about your salvation. Remember how I said your life is probably typically marked by your successes and your failures, okay? We hang on to successes because we love to talk about them. We did something well, and it created this in my life. I worked hard, and I got the promotion. I got a raise, so on and so on, okay? Worked really hard and aced the test. We get to talk about that. What I want you to understand about this is by grace you're saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It's God's gift, not from works, so that you can't take credit for it. Because God knows if we could work our way to earning our salvation, we would surely claim that as a win. So he says, here's what I'm going to do. Although I created Adam and Eve perfect and I told them not to do this, They did it anyway, and then it separated them from us from that point forward. Church, I need you to know God owed us nothing from that point forward. He decided, however, to make salvation possible. So he removed them from the garden. He then sent Jesus later on to come live on earth as man and as God to make salvation possible because it is this grace, which is an undeserved favor, through faith, because I was not there to see him get hung on a cross. I was not there to see him go into that grave. I was not there to watch him come back from the dead. So I have to have faith that that actually happened. And this is where a lot of us struggle right here. But let me tell you this. You can never, ever talk me out of what happened in my life. 
because I know what God rescued me from on that day. I know who I was before Jesus, and I know who I am now in Jesus, and it's because the faith I had in him and the Holy Spirit living inside of me, and no one can take that away from you either. And if that is not enough for you, history records all of these events too, just like the Bible does. We believe this is true, and it is by grace we are saved through faith. This is a gift of God, so I can do nothing to earn this, so I can't take credit for it. Why? Because verse 10 shows us everything that we're pulling together today. For we are his workmanship or masterpiece. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are created as his masterpieces in Christ Jesus for good works. You as a follower of Jesus... After your surrender, you start to work for Jesus. And what that means is you take that hope that you just received and you start to deal that out to other people. You start to live your life differently in those circles that you used to be in. People start to go, dude, what is happening with you? Why, why are you not doing this anymore? This is, what, this is who you were. This is what you used to do. And then you get the opportunity to say, I know, but let me tell you what happened. I've been rescued, man. I've been set free, and this is how, and this is why. And you know that as a follower of Jesus, this is what you're actually called to do. But to pull this all the way in and to show you this example, look at Ephesians 1, and 23. It says, He subjected everything under his feet and appointed him, that's Jesus, as head over everything for the church, which is his body, that is all of you sitting here, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Now, I want you to picture that this is the, the earth, okay? Now, we had a, a nice, clear, pretty bowl that we were going to use, but this is really ugly and kind of signifies the way of the world today. Would you all agree? <laughs> okay. So, if this is the world and God's intention is to fill all of this in every way with his grace and glory, how do you think that's going to be accomplished? Everybody at once say, through me. Go ahead. Okay, good. You're right. Good answer. He intends to accomplish filling the world with grace in every possible way through you, okay? So what this might look like is every single person, as you surrender your life to Jesus, you, you get a little bit of filling because you're now moved from death to life. Now, for those of you who have recently been saved like this, this is going to grow and increase for you. So you're going you're gonna to pour out into the world and you're going to be super excited and then you're going to keep getting filled back up, okay? Now, some of you are going to continue to go and nothing's going to ever be able to distract you from this life and this, okay? But some of you, you're going to get filled up and you're going to go halfway and then you're just going to kind of pause because Jesus did what you wanted him to do for you. He gave you a life you, you now no longer are ridden by anxiety and, and maybe like your life has changed enough, like you feel like you've told all of your inner circle what has happened to you and so really that's kind of enough for you, okay? But for some of you over here, this goes a little bit more, but for some of you it never fills back up and then you do this and you pour out and then as you go to tell other people, like you get a little bit of passion left back inside of you but then it's just too much for you to continue to pour out. Because the last time that you did this, it took a really long time for you to actually fill this back up and then you just ran dry. And the thing that I want you to understand about this is this person over here that pours in and is connected to Jesus, they are continually being filled back up by whatever it is that they pour out. And I want to say that this person is sitting in the service today, Okay. They've lived their life a certain way. They've gotten what they wanted to get from Jesus, but God does something and sparks something inside of them. And they go, you know what? This is me. Like Pastor Mike literally just described me. I was over here and I'm going to confess, but I'm moving back over here. And I need this to be filled back up because this is what God expects from me. And I'm ready to pour this out into the world and show them exactly who Jesus is and what he has done. And he promises that if you pour out, he will refresh and he will refill you. And then this is what the picture is supposed to look like. But then over here, this poor person is run dry. This person gives just a little bit when it's necessary, when life hits the fan, when they have nowhere else to turn, they come back to God and they get filled up just a little bit. 
and that's what they're satisfied with. Completely miserable. Miserable most of the time. Always wanting more and completely satisfied. And what I want you to understand is all of these things working together has filled this bucket up to right here. And what I would need you to see and understand is God has called every follower of Jesus to fill this up continually and always. And the reason why we see the gap of followers of Jesus in the lost people doing this is because we have too much of this inside of our churches today. We have a few of these sprinkled in and we have really, really rare cases of this. And the thing I need you to know about this church is every single follower of Jesus is called to this. But you know what this constitutes? This constitutes me asking the question, what am I created to, to be? And you answer it. Then you go on to, what am I made to do? And you answer it. Where am I to go to do this? And you answer it. That is this person right here. Do you realize that like the frustration and the anxiety and the worry about following Jesus is removed here? I'm not saying you're never going to be anxious or any of that again, but all of the stuff that is plaguing you from down here, God says, look, all you have to do is turn this stuff over to me. I promise I will take it away from you and fill you up. But yet we are content to stay here for some reason. And then if we just get some boost of spiritual energy, we're okay with this. But church, this is never going to get this done. And what I want you to understand about this is if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, this is what you're called to do. You realize this isn't even optional, right? Like you're supposed to stay here and continually be pouring and continually being filled up. And as you pour into the world and you see other followers of Jesus around you, like your responsibility is actually to pour into them too. Your responsibility is to look around and be so connected with other believers that you're not only filling the world up, but you're filling them up too. My question to you is like, are you willing to embrace the masterpiece that God has called you to be? Because the person who is full is a masterpiece. This person is still a masterpiece. They just don't know it yet. You're somewhere in between. For those of you that are not yet following Jesus, I know this is what you want from your life. You may not agree with us that God is the way to get that, and we're okay with that because we just want to have a conversation with you. But I want you to close your eyes, and I just want you to contemplate these closing thoughts. I want to remind you that God is good, so you don't need to look anywhere else for comfort or satisfaction. God is great, so you don't need to be in control. God is gracious, so you do not need to prove yourself. And God is glorious, so you do not need to fear anybody. The question is, do you believe you're a masterpiece today, and will you live this out? God, I pray for my friends and family and people I haven't met yet here today that they would desperately desire to live completely into what you've created them to be. I know none of us want to be frustrated with our lives and wonder if there's more and what we should do. And God, you don't hide these answers from us. You just tell us that we've got to surrender all of it and be continually connected to the source that fills us up, which is you and that intimacy with you. So I pray for those that are not yet following you today, that they would be willing to have a conversation with us today, to walk over to the couches to say, okay, let's just start talking through this. Tell me what this means. For those of us that are followers in this room, if we don't know how to answer those questions, God, let us turn away from this today to move back, to start having conversations with us, to start praying through these things and to start to answer these questions so we can be filled up and living in the masterpiece you call us to be. We love you and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.